Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains in Missouri, USA. Today we're looking at a bread bin, Commodore 64, that has a very classic black screen problem. The tricky part with a black screen repair is that it can be caused by many different things, so diagnosing the problem can sometimes be a little tricky. This particular machine arrived in pretty sad shape due to the way it was packaged for shipment. The case was broken and the board didn't work. So I'm going to divide this into two separate videos. In this first video, we're going to cover the board repair, and in the second video, we'll cover the case repair. So let's get started. This is a pretty good example of a typical machine that you're going to get by purchasing it online. It wasn't packed well, and consequently it got damaged in shipping, which was not UPS's fault. It just wasn't shipped well. I'll get you some close-ups here, but I've got a crack here on the keyboard, which is pretty common to have some breaks along the top here where it's the weakest. All the keys feel okay, though. And see, this is loose here, so we've got some breakage inside. Now, supposedly, when I bought this, it didn't, did not work. It came with a 1702 monitor that did work, but this did nothing. I'm not even going to plug it in before taking it apart to see what it looks like on the inside. Okay, so we saw the condition of the cover. I think it's salvageable, and it'll give us a good chance in a separate video to go over how to repair a damaged cover like that. And we'll cover some different ideas. I think in this video we'll concentrate on testing this board and seeing if we can't bring it back to life. Okay, we'll kind of do a close-up inspection here. See, this doesn't look like it's been wet or in a super damp environment. A little oxidation on the cover there. Try to move slower here so I don't make it really blurry. close at these filter caps on the SID. A lot of times those are the wrong value from the factory. I don't see a lot of sockets so it's maybe not have been worked on before. But here's something I did notice. Let me spin this bad boy around. It could be years of corrosion after those leads were welded onto that package. I'm not sure. And it doesn't look kosher to me though. But we'll test them and find out. I've got my component tester out and I'm going to test the capacitors in the power supply area. Now this sort of capacitance checker is not the most accurate in the world, but it does a fairly good job. I've compared its readings to those from our really expensive test equipment at work and it holds up fairly well and it's good enough for an application such as this. I found that the capacitors on these old Commodore 64s have held up fairly well and so unless I see an indication of a problem I don't change them out as a matter of course. Now we'll take the RF shield off the bottom. You need a soldering iron with a good width tip. This one is about four millimeters and it needs to be of sufficient wattage probably 40 watts or so for this task. I'm using a screwdriver to pry up on the tab as I heat it up. This one's been a little stubborn. There we go. Then we'll move on to the next one and you just work yourself around the board.
Now we'll give the back side of the board a visual inspection. Look for burnt traces, corrosion, that type of thing. Now this one looks pretty good. I don't see anything shocking or that concerns me greatly. I did miss the fact that there was one chip that had been replaced at one point in time. And you see these connectors that are hand soldered on at the factory. They look a little bad, but that's just the flux that's gotten kind of crusty over the years. It really doesn't hurt anything. Now before powering the board up, I want to check all the voltage trails to make sure nothing appears shorted. So here we're checking the fuse to start with. That's fine. It's not blown. And then we'll check across the 5 volt rail for the 5 volts from the power supply. That's fine. It's about 2.8K or 3K. And then we'll check the uh, 5 volt regulator that runs off the 9 volts AC coming from the power supply. That's okay. And then we'll check the 12 volt regulator. On the two onboard regulators, you want to check the input side and the output side of those. Now we'll apply some power to the board. I'm measuring the 5 volts that's coming from the external power supply here, and we have 4.93, which is fine. Then I'm going to measure the 5 volts from the internal regulator. We've got 10 volts on the input and 5 volts on the output. That's also fine. Now let's measure the 12 volt regulator. We have about 17 and a half, 18 volts on the input, which is fine, and 12 volts on the output. That's also fine. And just for good measure, we'll go over and check the 5 volt on one of the 7400 series logic chips. That's also fine. So the board should at least be doing something. Now if we look at what's happening on the screen, when we turn the power on, we get a black screen of course but you can't see in this video here but there is a stripe up the left side and we don't get a message saying there's no video so something's alive so what I've done now is pull out Mr. Sid chip and store him away in a safe place because it doesn't need to be in there for it to boot and run we just won't have any sound if there's something wrong with the Sid chip though it can keep it from booting so now we're going to go ahead and turn it on and unfortunately that didn't help at all. We know we have the proper voltages now so the next thing to do is to check for the clock. I'm going to do this on the VIC2 chip as well as the processor and we can check some of the other data lines and address lines and things like that while we're at it. Let's look at the oscilloscope now. So here we're looking at the clock input to the VIC-2, the video chip, and then we'll look at the clock input into the microprocessor and we see there is a clock, so something ought to be happening. And I noticed on the high address lines I kind of had this funny sawtooth looking wave which kind of looks like a shark fin and that didn't seem quite right to me. And here is what we typically expect to see. On the board, the things that have those top address lines in common are the PLA and a couple of the RAM address decoding chips, U13 and U25. <coughs> Let's take a look at what U13 and U25 do. Here I'm zoomed in on one page of the service manual that shows our RAM chips and U13 and U25. If we look here, we can see our high address lines that we thought looked a little funny. What these two chips do is select between two different sets of address lines and feeds those to the RAM chips. So you can think of it as like a row select and a column select. And if these aren't working correctly, uh, it can be selecting the wrong parts of the RAM and nothing will work right. And these are sort of a common failure point. So I made the decision to replace both U13 and U25. Uh, I'm using a little paste flux here, spread it on the pins of the chips. It'll help the solder reflow. You can also apply fresh solder uh, to get a similar effect. Swapping these two chips out at this point is more of an educated guess. Uh, they're not expensive if you don't happen to have them on hand and they are kind of a common failure point. So I got out my paste MBT rework station and I'm going through and desoldering all the pins.
Now the trick when using a desoldering tool like this is to not press down really hard. You just want to let the weight of the tool do the job. Leave it on there long enough to reflow the solder on both sides of the board and then give it a little bit of a wiggle to make sure you're freeing up the pin. After desoldering you want to take a small pair of pliers and wiggle each pin on the chip to make sure it's free. That way when you pop the chip out you're not going to take any traces with it. If you happen to find one that's still not free you can use the soldering iron to heat it up a little bit and try to free it up. Sometimes that'll work and sometimes you need to add a little fresh solder like I'm doing here and then use the solder sucker to remove the solder again. If it's on a ground or power plane, sometimes you have to do this a few times and leave the tool on there long enough to heat everything up. Here's a quick look at the top of the board. With just a little care and patience, we got the chip off there safely with no damage. When you install the socket, you want to make sure that the notch on top of the socket indicating the end where pin 1 is matches the indication on the board. You place the socket in the holes and kind of hold it in place. Tip the board over. While holding the socket in position from underneath, we can use a small screwdriver to bend over a couple of the pins on opposite corners to hold the socket in place. Now I'll solder one pin and then reach under the board and press up on the socket and reheat that same pin to make sure the socket is fully seated on the top side of the board. Then I'll get just a little dab of solder and do the same thing on another pin. This will hold the socket in place while we solder the rest of the connections. Now it's time to solder up all those pins. Take your time, don't use too much or too little solder, and don't dab on it. Leave the iron on there long enough to reflow the solder on each pin. Needless to say, replacing U13 and U25 it didn't do any good. So I got out another C64 board that was of the same assembly number and looked at those same address lines. So here's the same signal on one of those address pins and you can see we're seeing about the same thing. So that's perfectly normal and it's just a result of how the board works. Today's intermission features the new game Shadow Switcher. It's available for free download or for a small price. You can also order an actual disc with the accompanying literature. I'll put the link to this down below. And the author was kind enough to send me an MP3 of the music, which I've added to other parts of this video. Let's take a look. Oops, forgot one. The keys open the gates. Well, heck. This joystick I'm using needs some work. So you can switch which one is your shadow and get out of sticky situations. These sort of bricks crumble let you fall through. And I have the worst time with lightning bolts. I always seem to fry myself. I did the download first and then I went ahead and ordered the disc just to help support the efforts that these folks go through making these neat games for us these days. These are like an escalator or elevator and then you go through the open door and it takes you on to the next level. 
and they progressively get harder. Okay, I guess we'll get back to fixing actual hardware now. It's been several days since I worked on this board. I was waiting for this to come in. This is a dual diagnostic cartridge that does both the dead test and the diagnostic test. I got it from Core i64, which is a guy named Thomas Kristoff in Canada. This is a really nicely made cartridge. The switch has three positions. Up is dead test, down is diagnostic test, and the center is normal run mode, and there's also a reset button built in. So I'll plug in the dual test cartridge with it in dead test mode and turn it on. With the power switch on, we get the bar up the left hand side of the screen so we know something's happening and it'll take about 20 or 30 seconds before we get the screen to pop up. And it goes through and it'll test various parts of the RAM and some other components. And it'll take oh, perhaps a minute and a half to run the complete test, so I'll speed up the rest of this. This C64 dead test first tests the RAM on a basic level, and if it finds a fault, it will flash the screen between black and white a given number of times, and you can look up what that means in the manual. Then it'll go through and do a little more extensive test on different parts of the RAM, the zero page, the stack, etc., that you can see up there. And it'll also do a basic sound test, which I don't have the SID plugged in, so we're not going to hear anything there. So this gives us an indication that the RAM, the processor, the PLA, and the supporting glue logic chips, as well as the VIC chip and the SID chip, if we had it plugged in there, are working. This dead test mode does not use any of the ROMs. It doesn't use the kernel ROM or the basic ROM or the character generator ROM. Everything is on the test cartridge itself. If we put it in diagnostic mode and turn it back on, we get nothing, which turns out to be a very important clue. So at this point, the dead test tells us that the processor's working, the PLA is at least mostly working, the VIC chip is working, and the RAM and the associated glue logic is probably working too. Now, as I mentioned before, the dead test does not use the three ROMs. Since we didn't get any function with the cartridge in the diagnostic test mode, that meant something that was unique to that mode and not to the dead test mode was probably at fault. Well, one of the things in the diagnostic test manual it mentioned was three control signals that go from the processor to the PLA. Let's have a look at those. Here are our three signals in question, low RAM, high RAM, and the character enable, I think that is. Um, these are generated by the processor and they control the bank switching for the RAM. So you can switch out the ROMs and use the RAM underneath it. And this lets you do things like copy the contents of the basic ROM to the RAM underneath it and then start running from RAM so you can modify basic things like that. And if this isn't working right, uh, then you know we're going to get uh, nonsense because we might be reading from the wrong uh, section of memory. And so here in the diagnostic manual, what it means is that we should see a plus five volt pulse on those three pins. So I set about to check those. The three signals in question come in on pins six, seven, and eight of the PLA. So we'll measure those. So with the power on, you can see that it's high all the time on all three pins. So this could be that the PLA has an internal problem and it's holding all three lines high. It could be that the processor has a problem where it's never generating those signals. Or it could be there's a problem with the kernel ROM and it's not running the correct code so those lines aren't being turned on and off as they should be. Since the PLA was the most likely candidate to fail, I pulled it and installed a socket. Here I've got the original PLA in place. I tried replacing it with this replacement PLA that I bought a few years ago off of eBay and I got some RAM faults then. 
just the black and white flashing screen which puzzled me and then I remembered that to use this replacement PLA requires installing a couple extra capacitors on the board to fix some timing issues and I had done that on the board I borrowed this PLA from but not this particular board so it just wasn't going to work here. So I put the original PLA chip back in and got to thinking more about what would happen if the kernel ROM was bad. Now if the kernel ROM was bad it's not going to read the correct code and it'll just do nonsense. So I pulled the kernel ROM and I installed this funky red socket and I also did the same thing on this donor board. Now this is the one I also borrowed the PLA from. This one had a good kernel ROM but it was a version 2 which I was going to replace anyhow. In version 2 of the kernel ROM there's a bug that causes some text to display in wrong colors in certain situations. It just operated a little differently than either version 1 or version 3. So I was going to eventually replace this with the version 3 anyhow. I'm not sure where my dip extractor is so please don't scream at me through your computer for popping it out this way. I'm going to pop out the original kernel ROM that was in this machine and I'm going to pop in the one from the donor board. So with our borrowed kernel ROM and the dual diagnostic cartridge in the diagnostic test mode, we'll go ahead and give it a whirl. Now with power on, ah, we get the diagnostic screen. This performs a lot of the same test as the dead test cartridge mode, but with one important exception, it's actually using the kernel ROM from the Commodore 64 itself. So we can see it goes through various RAM tests and it will also try to check some of the other chips. Now a lot of these other checks rely on a loopback harness which connects one port to another port and it turns on the output on one port and receives that on another port so it can check both of those. I haven't made that harness so you're going to see some failures. Well, crap. That SID chip is not too healthy, is it? Okay, so I have installed a replacement SID and we'll run through the test again and see how this sounds. So, uh, here is our replacement SID. You notice this isn't a genuine SID, it is an ARM SID. It's the first time I've had a chance to plug one in and test it. It seems to work fine. You can hear it there in the background, so I'll do some more extensive testing and we'll do a separate video on that. You notice how compact it is. It is about the same size as the original chip, but it's not oversized like some of the other SID replacement options are. With all the soldering work done, I'm going to go ahead and clean up the flux residue on the back of the board. To do this, I'll use some denatured alcohol and a toothbrush and a rag. Just gently scrub the area where all the flux is you want to get off there. And if you just do this, you're just smearing the flux around. So after you get that off of there, you want to take your rag and just dab that residue off the board. The areas of the board like these connectors here where they were hand soldered from the factory always look nasty but that's just an appearance but I like to clean them up anyhow. It's good to check where the connectors are they get plugged into a lot because the solder joints there can be cracked. The area by the video connector and serial connector looked kind of suspicious so I'm looking at that under a lighted magnifier and indeed I think I'll scrape some of the silk screen off of there and re-solder that. After carefully scraping back some of the silk screen around the leads from the connectors, I am using my soldering iron and a little fresh solder to reflow those to make sure there's a solid connection for years to come. Now I'm going to clean off the old heatsink compound on the VIC chip using a rag and some denatured alcohol. It's a messy job, but somebody has to do it. Now I'll clean off 
the heat sink compound that's on the tab on the cover. Now we'll put on a nice thin layer of heat sink compound on the tab. Too much is as bad as too little here. And then we'll go ahead and pop the cover back in place. Now I'm going to go ahead and reinstall the bottom RF shield. Just set it down into place, make sure it's centered and that the insulating card underneath it is centered. And then bend the tabs over as much as you can. With the wide chisel tip back in the soldering iron and a lot of flux on the joints, I'm using a screwdriver to push the tab down as I'm heating it up. And I'll continue to keep pressure on the tab until the solder solidifies. And slowly just work my way around the board. One other thing I want to cover on this particular computer is that the keyboard is the older style that uses the gold plated contacts, not the carbon plated contacts like we saw in the 64C repair that we did a few weeks ago. Another small difference is the shift lock key. On the bread bin it has an external spring and the solder tabs are kind of look like little ears of a circuit board sticking out. On the 64C they were metal pins and there was no external spring. You can also see the cap looks a little different. It has a sort of adapter that plugs up into a standard shaped key cap. To clean these types of contacts you can very gently wipe them with a clean pencil eraser and then wipe down with alcohol or you can use some contact cleaner on a cotton bud. Well, as you can see behind me, we've got this old Commodore bread bin working and that replacement SID chip sounds pretty good as well. It took a little head scratching to come to the understanding that the main fault with this computer was just the kernel ROM. Having that dual test cartridge from i 64 really made this diagnosis a lot simpler and I learned a lot in the process. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you're not a subscriber, please consider subscribing. Click on that subscribe button down below and also click on the bell shaped icon. When you click on that bell icon, you'll be notified right away when I post a new video. So you'll get to be one of the first to watch it. If you have any comments or suggestions for other videos or questions, just leave them in the comments section down below. I'll put the links to the website for this test cartridge as well as for this nifty game called Shadow Switcher that's running behind me. I really love this game. It's a really simple concept, but it's very addictive and it's very fast paced. This is also some of the music I've been playing during the video. Thanks, until next time. Thank you.